Yeah. Yeah. So when you go to the site, can you like walk us through what's, what any of us might do if we wanted to invest? So basically, you go to this link. Josh, this is not a real link. It wasn't mine. It's a uh, one lowercase. No, no. Why was it fundride.se? Okay. Basically, oh, and then um, one lowercase a. Oh, this one done. Uh, one lowercase a. Capital T, lowercase t, capital K D I. This is the sort of general general link. And basically, what you do is you can log in. Oh, no. I hope Facebook. You can log in <laughs> with a with a social network like LinkedIn or Facebook, and you basically say like, what are my investment objectives? Um, you basically have to answer questions as though you're going to invest, but you don't actually have to invest. And so a lot of people have said, well, I'm not going to join because I don't have any money. And it's like, well, it's, it's not really the point. The point is that we're using the vehicle for, for outreach and for building sort of affinity for the model. And so, yeah, we know a lot of ways it can happen. Basically, basically, you can join without having the commitment of doing much with it. What will happen is we have to we put together an investment offering, and then they approve it. Or who's so, they? Uh, the fundraising management team. Who's that? Um, it's like... They have about a dozen people who do, I mean, they're like real estate investment professionals. In DC? In DC, yeah. So, do you work for Fundrise? I do, I do not, actually. I work, I mean, I, well, no, I do not. I work with Fundrise, so. That, that capital investment, it's only real estate. It doesn't go to the operating? No, it's, it's, uh, hmm. It's all for real estate. Yeah, it's all for real estate. But one of the, the one thing I'd say to that is that a lot of times, depending on who's doing the project, you're going to have cost structures that are a little bit different based on whether you're investing in like a developer or like a, you know, is the developer subcontract? Is the developer contracting with a builder or a contractor to do something? So like as you increase the layers of um, the layers of middlemen, basically, sort of. So here's a cost gets more complicated. I was going to get more. Sure. Like, this is what the city is flooded with: mm -hmm. uh, partial business and residential. So they'll have whatever three or four condo apartments above and a business below. Sure. They never want to rent those businesses out because they're taking basically a tax loss on that and living off the rents. So some of those have fallen fallen into foreclosure. So um, the question is, if I want to invest in that business, there's a project, you've got four rentals in a business. Does any of the capital investors get into a business that might be a coffee shop? Or I, I think that, I don't think you've been, I'm not entirely sure about the limits of what the capital can be used for, but I'm like 95% sure that it's like a, that it's all to be used for like the development of the space. You can't use it for operating capital of a business in a space. But I do know that their first, uh, their first project, their first affordable housing offering, affordable, which in San Francisco means twenty eight hundred dollars a month. Um, <laughs> I'm not like making this up. It's a one million dollar project that's going to renovate two units and a bookstore. But I don't think that any of it goes toward the operations of the business itself. I think it only goes toward the actual space. The space renovation. Yeah. So like, so like, past build out. And there are probably some blurry lines where build out actually ends, but you can't use like buy inventory for your grocery store. Sure. Can you speak to like a specific project that has been completed in DC using the fundraise model? Sure. Um, so they had a few. They've, they've done a few, and I don't know exactly what they're called, but they're basically like they've done several, and they're they're sort of typically six figure, three hundred, four hundred thousand, whatever dollar projects they are sort of like to renovate and build out a storefront or an apartment. You can check them out on the website. So sure, they, sure. So I'm just trying to get a better sense of how much, so when you have like 300 people that go all in on like a property to try and rehab the building, for instance, 
How long do they maintain equity within the building? Does that equity is dissolve when the business opens, or like what is the structure? What, is, what happens after it's built? So there, there are different ways to set it up, and that's a question of how you set up the offering. So you can set it up however you want, basically. You can say, we're going to give you an equity chair. We're going to basically have this function almost like a loan. You get like an interest based or you know, rate of return on that. Um, for me, I'd like to think about a way to bundle a bunch of projects together, because otherwise, like we're not gonna, it doesn't make sense to say, we're going to do an investment offering for $5,000 and then raise it from one investor. The idea would be to like say, we're going to do like a 15 unit scatter site thing that's going to cost like $175,000. Typically, what I'd want to do is basically say, invest at least 100 bucks, and you will get a return of whether it's somewhere in the five to 10 percent, something like that, you know. And then you get that money back at the end of whatever term. Which is another question: What is the term? And the term would probably be, I don't know, typically like a couple of years. Typically, we've done. I've done. I have a couple outstanding investments right now for. 12 month loans, a couple for 18 months, and then like two that are like five and six and seven years. So. so then are there, so Kickstarter has like a bunch of stats. It talks about how many projects there have ever been, um, how often they've been successful, yeah. how long it took. Sure. Like are there similar statistics that look at the past um, fundraise projects? There are not because it's very new. So. Um, how, when was it founded? Like last year. Okay. So. They started, I believe they started raising money last summer. And they've been moderately successful. But the thing that I think is interesting is that they have no presence in the Midwest and they have no presence in affordable, affordable housing development in inner cities. So it's sort of like, this is new territory for them, it's new territory. It's not new territory for me, but. So what, like, is, what is their like typical project, you would say? Mixed use development? In I think they probably do a lot of, you know, mid to higher density mixed use development, you know, it's really more a matter of supplementing financing from other sources. So residential, commercial? A lot of it is accelerating gentrification. So if you've got a neighborhood that's that's transitioning, what they'll do is they'll be like, oh, give coffee shop owner, you want to open up a coffee shop there and you want to like crowdfund it, then that's what they do. It's Which a lot is of that. not what I want to do. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> He wants to do something a little more interesting than that. But that's, that's what it tends to get used for. And I, I should say real quick, and then, uh, yeah, I should say that, uh, oh yeah, like one of the things that's interesting to me is that um, a lot of people who are on Fundrise are very much like, we're real estate developers, which means like we're like white men in suits who write checks, which is very different from like what I think of as the process of actual neighborhood development, which is like, small individual people. Like I talked to a guy the other day who was like, oh, like can you help me raise money? My wife and I we have houses in Gary. And I said, well how much money do you want? He was like, oh, like probably like eight thousand dollars per house. I was like, wow, because if you had a commercial real estate developer doing this, they'd say like, oh like we're getting a bargain at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per house. And these price points are totally different and it's a question of social equitability and disparities and racial and social boundaries and all sorts of things. So that's why this is interesting, is that there just hasn't been, it, it hopefully will lower the barrier to people like the guy who wants to renovate a place for $8,000 in places where it doesn't, banks won't go because either there's a bad reputation or the return just isn't high enough. But not everyone cares about a super fat return. They just want to see that block stable. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of what caught my attention for the this thing. Yes. So years ago, when I was young, I worked briefly as a, uh, um, an hourly person for real estate research, which was uh, owned by a bank and had at one point been a, an actual real estate company and uh, sort of a consultancy. And they um, they were at, one of their projects was urban infill. So the idea being to use properties that were in, in the city rather than to just have more small and, and costlier extension of services. So maybe I missed this because I was tweeting a little bit of your talk, but uh, um, do you have, is it all we have of structures or is there any um, uh, uh, vacant lots adjacent to structures or, you know, I mean, is this a path to improving the ratio? Well, right. So I should say I'm very interested in like high density. Um, I'm very interested in high density. I'm dense, interested in infill, like very, very close to my heart. You know, kind of an issue. Um, 
most of the stuff I've been working on is rehabbing, rehabbing um, like derelict structures because uh, that's sort of like what I started doing. Uh, it's also way less capital intensive to do that than to build a brand new structure. Um, I will say I'm interested in doing a project in Gary right now that's basically going to be developing this aforementioned nine acres of land into sort of like mid density, like four to six plexes. Um, but it's a question of like, you know, I have this like private equity guy who's like, I may or may not come through with the millions of dollars that's going to put this together. And that's just like, it's a bigger project than I necessarily even can handle doing myself. So definitely interested in it um, for a lot of reasons, you know. But yeah, that's that's sort of that's sort of like a longer term plan, mm -hmm. unless I can find the right partners to do it sooner. So. Uh, do we have a question? Someone back here has a question? Um, you, you answered it okay. <clears throat> thoroughly. Um, I, I was interested in, so you explained the process of financing it really well. I was interested in um, how the space is determined. Are the people who are funding these projects also helping develop the ideas for what these spaces can become? Yeah. Or um, is it more democratic? Uh, across the entire neighborhood, including yeah. people that didn't um, give funds? Yeah, so I, I think um, a lot of people have said, like, well, can you even finance the whole renovation with people who just live on that one block? And the answer is no, because people don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to sort of use them more for their social capital and their input to the project mm -hmm. um, and use, the, use that as sort of like a point of leverage for bigger money for the outside. Um, when I got into urban development, I didn't really think so much about. I was like, "What's wrong with us, like hipsters, riding our fixed gear bikes into these neighborhoods and then leaving?" At the end of the day, it's like, "Well, there's a lot, there's a lot wrong with it." And so the question is, like, you really have to work within a community to figure out what the community wants and what the community needs, and you have to like have a much more critical conversation about how to do that, mm -hmm. um, which involves like community forums and outreach, uh, which is something that a lot of people don't want to do, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, this mistaken idea in urban development that if we give people affordable housing, they'll figure it all out. It's like people don't want that. Like they need that, obviously, but they, they yeah. It's a bigger conversation, obviously. Um, how, do you, how do you actually get to industry properties on your site? So you basically have to put together an offering, and the offering is a package of this pretty monstrous package of like documents, and it's like a proposal that involves like a lot of information. <laughs> Which is why it's I mean it's, it's a, you basically have to say this is my private placement memorandum. We're basically going to say this is our operating agreement. This is how the corporate structure is set up. This is the the you know capital stack. Like this is the it's like very. It's like way more complicated than, say, a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. Which is why I would sort of want to like figure out a way to bundle a couple projects together. And Gary, the funding doesn't streamline that at all. You still have to print the stuff out. Of they streamline it because the, the thing, the, the, there's like the estimated number of hours that it takes to complete like an SEA, SEC Regulation A filing is something like 640 hours or something. And so it's like we talked about doing this with a partnership I worked for, and they were like. We're gonna crowdfund this. I know you like those things like crowdfunding. I was like, well, what, what do you have in mind? And they're like, well, we're gonna pay lawyers like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then we're gonna get like one point two million out of it. And I was like, I think you missed the point. You know, like, sort of a lot of money to be paying to people who really have no investment in the project. Right. So they do streamline it, but it still requires legwork. So is are we gonna need to have a totally different? <coughs> Like legal vehicles to happen to make this really efficient because 600 hours is crazy. Right? Well, you, you don't have to put 600 hours into ones with fundraising. Oh, I see. I'm saying the traditional SEC filings. Okay, okay. So they have simplified it. it yeah, it's simplified from the the actual filing process. Got it. Um, how difficult is it? I have not done it, so that is a great question. Um, I'm hoping to do it in the next like two or three months, but the problem is that like. You know, it involves a lot of questions that I'm basically trying to work with them to figure out how to how I can do something that's going to be like substantial enough that it'll make sense. Um, so I imagine it's going to be more than a couple days of work. But that's the other thing is that like I think as we have these conversations like this one, we're going to figure out ways to make these systems work better, as opposed to 
like this article I read in Forbes yesterday, which was like, oh, the Jobs Act is great because it allows accredited investors to invest multi-million dollars, and it's like, well, it's not really like helping us down here on planet Earth. It's like everything is about the, the whole idea of the, the crowd and the cloud. You know, it's like this whole like decentralizing, but also making things smaller by breaking them down into manageable parts. So. Uh, I'll be around. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, a really quick question. Sure. Any regulatory concerns, like with the investment side of it, with the SEC or anything like that? They had a, I think they had a pretty hard time getting it approved by the SEC, but then they did. Right now, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I don't know what the exact story was, but I know that it was kind of difficult to get it pushed through. And I, don't, yeah, I don't know exactly how. I don't know if that's still an ongoing thing or not. Or... I don't think it is, but they have copped a lot of criticism, or they did before, yeah. from Orthodox investment people who are like, this is bizarre and lofty and vicious and it's not going to work at all. Okay. But change is hard. Like, that's a lot of it. So, that's in the Yeah, for sure. So, so, I have a question about kind of what you were saying, but <clears throat> there's a, a tension between affordability and fiduciary duty, right? And, you know, I, I think this would be a wonderful idea if it could mean that, you know, you know top neighborhood people could invest in their own neighborhood and improve the neighborhood. But that might mean that they're getting, they're holding down the rents and they're getting lower returns. And so there's a there's a natural conflict between, and I'm just worried that you would have 300 investors, 150 of which wanted to get a higher return, and 150 of which might want to, you know, preserve affordability in the neighborhood, which is a good. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you how do you navigate that? I, I, I think that there is a. I think that my whole interest is in figuring out a way that you can sort of say, like, we're going to give, I, I would love to be able to give a preferential rate of return to people who live within the target area, and then a lower rate of return to people who don't live in the target area. For the simple. You might find that's the exact opposite of what the market is, right? Mm -hmm. so you don't it's live quite possible. Area. But when I approached it, I had said, like, basically, okay, so there's a huge demand for affordable housing, but the way we think about it is, like, in Gary, there's a historic rehab project, for example, that we have these um, historic apartments at a cost of like $345,000 per unit. And so they're like, well, these are affordable, so it's great. It's like, well, it's not affordable to the taxpayer. Because like, the taxpayer is putting the bill, keeping these units affordable, that's not equitable to anyone. Um, so it, it, is, it is a balance, but I think the, the point is, is to figure out a way to, I think that you can make the cash flow work either way. Um, do the investors sign on to one or the other? I mean, are there people who yeah, say, are they're giving up? There could be different types of shares. I want to keep the rents down, I don't need money, I uh, want to have good neighbors, or yeah, I mean, like, you can give is, are there other people saying, I want to be on the money side? I mean, how do they? I think you can say, I think you basically determine it at the point of the offering to say, like, we will offer a rate of return of X, and it's going to be fixed. So then when you end up doing, I mean, this is the other thing, is that, like, when you're talking about commercial real estate and all the, the whole point of Fundrise, the, they state on their website is basically like the cutting out of many middlemen that drive up the cost by 10 to 20 percent for every project. And people will say, "I got this great project. I can write a check and then make 12 percent of my money." Whereas in reality, they could be doubling that return theoretically without these additional layers involved. And so it's sort of a matter of saying, like, in affordable housing, you find the cash flow because there's a demand at the lowest segment of the market. Like, period. Um, and that's sort of a starting point to think about how to answer your question. I think you can find people who lend these lower rates. But it's just the point is that it's not blood money that's like basically like saying, we've done deals before where they're like, we demand a, a rate of return of like, you know, like 10% in like a month or something like that, you know? It was like, it's got some questions for sustainability, you know? For social sustainability, I guess. I think you can do that in a tax right? So. You have an investor that doesn't live in the neighborhood, wants 15%, but the guy that lives in the neighborhood will take 10. So on the tax side, if the tax rate is 10, so you just even it out at the end. So if you got a local investor who doesn't pay the capital gains tax or return tax, but the outside investor does, and that the returns are the same. Well, yeah, I mean, it would even out in that sense, but I guess in, in this. That's the way to do it, excluding an outside investor. Sure. Sure. Yeah, definitely. And I think that there, I think that we'll we'll come into questions like that as we file the offering and say like what you know. Sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 All right. Well. Oh. Yeah, cool. Thank you so Thanks much. much. Okay. So if you, if you want to talk to me, keep.